Well, first, let me uh, begin by thanking you for the opportunity to speak here tonight, stuff that uh, I'm deeply excited and passionate about. So the title of my talk is called, uh, and can you, can you folks hear me? Great. Uh, it's called Decoding the Brain. And really what I hope to convince you about in the next uh, 20, 30 minutes is that uh, the brain is not a black box. It's, the brain is something that we can know and understand. And, uh, and that I think we're at a very exciting time right now where we're just starting to learn some of these principles. So to begin with, first just to, about what I'm going to be talking about. First I'm going to give you a brief historical overview of how we've come to understand brain function. Some of the dynamic analysis and applications of some of the recent things that have gone on, some of their implications, and some of the future directions. So really, when you look at it 200 years ago, the first ways we began to understand brain function incorrectly was through phrenology, basically ascribing function to different bumps on the head. And, uh, but we it, I think uh, it really started to take on some level of seriousness uh, in the mid-19th century, where basically with lesions in the brain, uh, we started to learn about how different parts of the brain work by its dysfunction. And kind of a classic example is Phineas Gage. He was a, a railway, railway worker who basically was a very God-fearing, very serious um, man who basically got a railway spike through his brain, which you kind of see right here. And it was kind of very newsworthy back then. And he went and it basically injur injured b the uh, frontal lobes of his brain. And after that, he became a very disinhibited gentleman where he would cuss all the time, he would kind of, you know, kind of go to the bathroom on the streets, and really people at that point suddenly realized, well, the frontal lobes are important for personality and inhibition. And that was kind of one of the first forays in kind of essentially the study of lesions of the brain. And really that went on for really the next 150 years, and even to somewhat today, where we, start to, where we still learn about how the brain works by certain areas of dysfunction. So, and kind of concurrent with that, really at the, the turn of the century, we learned that not only the, that the brain is an electrical organ, that it generates electrical activity. And this gentleman, Hans Berger, out of Germany, was the first guy to discover EEG. And even at that time, he thought that, well, maybe that these oscillating brain waves can tell us something about how the brain works and even understanding thoughts. But it really wasn't until uh, really kind of the 80s where we started to look at some epiphenomena associated with brain activity, which told us, told us about where function was occurring. And it was usually with uh, kind of such things as alterations in blood flow, blood oxygenation, or metabolism. Uh, and we used those changes to identify what certain areas of brain function, where they were located. And again, they gave us kind of some rough pictures of uh, where activity in the brain was going on with certain cognitive functions. And just to give you a brief kind of summary of those, um, for instance, we learned that the back part of the brain, the occipital lobes, are uh, involved with uh, visual processing. Again, a lot of these things we learned through lesional studies, but this is really the first time that we were start essentially seeing the brain in action. The frontal lobes, let's see if I, is it coming up here? Yeah. Uh, again, involved in executive function, you know, higher level decision making. Uh, inhibition, as we learned with Phineas Gage 150 years prior. Our temporal lobes, kind of the bottom part of our brains, and our, our, the middle part of those temporal lobes involved with uh, memory. The back part of our frontal lobes involved with motor function. And two areas uh, known as uh, Wernicke's area and Broca's area, again, which we initially learned by lesioning, uh, involved in uh, the production and the understanding of speech. But it's not perfect yet, because in some ways, we're still ascribing function to lumps and bumps. Now we're doing a little bit better of a job than now it's actually on the brain. But uh, so it really was, in, I think, with animal models, uh, again, in the 70s and 80s, where we started to really kind of become, uh, where we started to learn how information is encoded in the brain. And, uh, and, that, and really with some of the monkey models in the 80s, and I would like to go through just a brief example of that, where when they started putting microelectrodes into, uh, co into the cortex of brains, where they started to learn how the brain is actually encoding information. And just to give you, an, this is one of the first examples of that, a kind of a famous gentleman by the name of Georgopoulos. And he did a fairly simple experiment. He had electrodes in, in the monkey motor cortex. And what he had the monkey do is he had it manipulate this thing called a manipulandum. Basically, a simple articulated arm. And the monkey, and you can see his arm right here, basically had to do what's called a center out task. And what that involved was basically moving from the center of the, uh, the, the screen here to some peripheral target, which you see circled. And here's actually the tracings that the monkey drew out. You can see it's at zero degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees. 
And when you actually looked at the um, neuronal firing rate, you ba what they basically found was that for a certain direction for that particular neuron, it had a, essentially a directional preference. And when you, not to get you know, too involved in this, but when you regress that to a line, it formed a cosine curve. And they, they started to refer to this as cosine tuning, meaning that basically for a given neuron, it had a directional predilection. And that when it wanted to go, when it fired at a rapid rate, that would predict the monkey's arm movements. And when you looked at a whole bunch of neurons together, you could actually predict very precisely in three-dimensional space where that monkey wanted to move his arm. And this is just a kind of a graphical representation of that. And each of those lines represents the action of potential firing rate. And it's kind of like a bunch of neurons voting, and the loudest guy voting seems to, you know, kind of predominate. So again, looking at this, you can kind of appreciate some of the implications for this for somebody with the uh, severe motor disabilities. <laughs> now, so that was single unit systems. Now, also again, going back to these uh, uh, electrical rhythms from the scalp, again, we, we were able back then to get very simple um, signals for whether the motor cortex was active or not active, depending on how these uh, frequency, certain frequency bands, bands changed in amplitude. And so, again, we could use that as a signal for very simple device control. And let me show you an example of that. Oops. And again, the, this guy has a... Uh, oops. Can you see my mouth? Oh, I guess not. There we go. Keeps him disappear. But he's got an electrode cap on. Those are, again, recording signals from the surface of his brain. And he can control the cursor, whether it goes right or left, based on motor imagination. So, he's got to work at it a little bit here but eventually he gets it. So now, you, I've shown you some good examples, but really getting to the, to, the, to the next step, as a clinical platform, something that can actually help somebody with some severe motor disabilities, there's some problems. And part of that is with EEG and single unit system, there's features to them which really prohibit practical application. <coughs> EEG, uh, gives you relatively simple control, and, and because it has problems with signal to noise, it gives you somewhat erratic function. It really takes a long time to train to get very simple levels of control. Single unit systems, as, I, as I've shown you, as you, they get very f high level of control, but they're relatively invasive. You have to actually put them in the cortex. And also, and this is kind of more very clinically relevant, is that scar starts to form around those very small electrodes. And because of that, they, they lack what we call durable effect. They only last for around six months in monkeys and around six months in uh, some preliminary human trials. And what that means is that you have to do kind of repeat surgeries every six months. And that really isn't practical for somebody with some severe disabilities where they have to keep on relearning how to use this. And where kind of our group at Washington University came into the picture was that it was an alternative strategy. It was using what's called electrocorticography or ECOG. And that's signal acquired from the surface of the brain without penetrating the brain. And that signal has some unique features in that it's much more robust than EEG. You can see a much broader frequency. It has much better regional discrimination, meaning that you can really see kind of, you know, fine points of act activation, millimeters versus the centimeters with EEG. And because you're not penetrating the brain, scarring is much less of an issue. This is actually kind of a picture for, hopefully nobody's too faint of heart here, but this is actually a picture of a human brain dur during surgery. Uh, and we actually put these grid electrode arrays for a clinical indication uh, for localizing seizures. There's a certain population of patients with intractable epilepsy actually require the placement of these electrodes over the surface of the brain so we can find where those seizures are coming from and then actually take that part of the brain out to treat their seizures. This also provides us with a very unique opportunity to essentially get invasive electrical activity from the brain. So these patients have these electrodes over the surface of their brain for a couple weeks while we wait for them to have seizures. And during that period of time, we uh, actually do experiments with them where we have them participate in various uh, uh, cognitive tasks. And what we found was, uh, and kind of really to, somewhat to our surprise, it was kind of, kind of walking into this Aztec 
uh, gold mine where we suddenly found all this really cool information was that where EEG really gave us only frequencies of around you know, 0 to 40 hertz. When we started to look at the, you know, the, these frequencies um, under the skull, there's kind of a whole world opened up. Uh, these high frequencies. And what we started to discover is that these high frequencies carry substantial information about cognitive intentions. And this is just a, a brief example. Uh, when we looked at, for instance, pa uh, monkeys, or monkeys, uh, patients moving, uh, uh, moving a joystick around, kind of like that manipulandum that I showed you earlier with the monkey moving it around in circles, was that depending on which direction they moved, these high frequencies were able to tell us what direction uh, the, the human being was intending to move. And so, for instance, when they moved in this very simple example, looking at one electrode over motor cortex, and we looked at frequency over time, that when they moved to the left, the high frequencies here would go up, and when they moved to the right, that those high frequencies would go down in amplitude. And so we started to find multiple different electrodes that could essentially help us predict which direction the person wanted to move that cursor. And so, and we put that to some good use, and I'll show you some examples. Again, we found some signals which told us about cognitive intention, and now we wanted to utilize those for device control. And this is an example of one, one of our uh, subjects who uh, is controlling a cursor, uh, again, with thought alone, towards uh, so four peripheral targets. And can you see that cursor? It's kind of small. And also, just to put this into perspective, so he did this about in about an hour of training. And some of the other, um, relative to some of the other uh, constructs with single unit systems as well as with uh, EEG, it takes around, uh, with single units it takes several months, with uh, EEG it takes you know, several months to years to get even close to that type of control. So the control was very fast, and part of that was predicated on the fact that we were utilizing these high frequencies. No, there's nothing connected to it. This is all from brain activity alone. Yeah? So what is he thinking about there? It's a great question. Um, it basically, a <laughs> yeah, so the question was, what is he actually thinking when he's doing that? Well, initially we tell him, imagine moving your hand going up, down, left, right. But what, what, and that's what he originally was doing. But when you ask him at the end of the session, he says, well, and again, this is anecdotal, I can't prove this, but he says, well, I just wanted to go up, down, left, right. It's, it becomes intention-based. And really what we found is, and I, I, could, I don't have the slides in here to show it to you, but people, you know, very quickly, once they get this closed-loop feedback, basically learn uh, to tune their brain signals to what the computer is looking for. And they learn it very quickly with feedback. I noticed the subject moves its, its head. Uh, uh -huh. Can you have that sort of uh, effect with just that amygdala just through moving the eyes rather than moving the head. Oh, the head movement actually has nothing to do with him. He's just following it. That, that, that's all, it's purely, purely brain activity. Um, that it really, it, it, and I'll sh actually, I'll show you some other examples here um, to show you that that's actually kind of not important. Um, so here's another example where base, he is moving his, he uses actual movements this time, which you're going to see, he's going to play space invaders here. And to get the cursor to go to the right, he uses real hand movements. Uh, but again, it's, it's being derived, the, the control is being derived from brain signal alone. Right, right hand movements to the, move his um, uh, cannon to the right. Tongue movements, which you can't see, move it to the left. So he's got basically two control features, right and left. So he, you can see he's, he's basically waiting for that fi final space invader. He shoots it. And if you watch his hand, it, He's actually really good at dodging and juking. And again, this is brain activity that's controlling this. So he's kind of upset about that. <laughs> now, but one of the important things is that essentially when you look at brain activity, especially with motor movements, there's essentially no diff very little difference between um, real movements and imagined movements. So now we say, well, you really don't actually need to move your hands. Stop that. Um, pretty much he has the same level of performance. And, but I think, you know, one thing that I want to kind of, you know, talk about is this kind of notion of a, the neural code or uh, kind of a, somewhat of a colloquial term. But I think what 
what it's telling us is that really, you know, we kind of really found the iceberg with brain-computer interfacing. And the point being is that the, the information in the brain is knowable, that we can decode this information, this electrical activity from whether it be cortex or even deeper brain structures, to really understand the information of our thoughts and our intentions. And so, and kind of more strictly defined, the idea being that there's fundamental electrophysiologic rules which um, govern kind of information in the brain. You know, again, layman's term, the electrical language of the mind, that the information are, are, of our thoughts is coded by some defined electrical patterns. What are some of those patterns? Oh, well, uh, and that I think just as the, kind of, to draw a parallel, I think it's almost kind of like the human genome, is that just as the genome is governed by information coded in a series of nucleotides, that there's the same a correlate level of organization, and we're just basically just beginning to scratch the surface of that. And so some, the way that some of this information is encoded is in spatial encoding, what part of the brain is involved, and temporal encoding, meaning, for instance, action potential firing, as I showed you earlier with um, uh, the, the uh, firing rates of neurons, as well as frequency encoding, meaning frequency band and how those frequency bands change. And I think, just as I think, you know, certain kind of, you know, movements in science have really led to some things that have changed our society and changed the way we live, such as, you know, lunar exploration and kind of, you know, research in space really led to, you know, computers, internet, modern jet propulsion, satellite communications, modern materials, really in the, from the 60s leading to now. And mapping out the human genome has really led to kind of, you know, an a revolution in, you know, novel molecular techniques for treating diseases, infections, cancer, biotechnology, bioinformatics, individual risk assessments, personalized medical therapies. I think that uh, understanding the, the way that information is encoded in the brain has that same level of gravitas, that basically the, the, the possibilities for more efficient ways of communication, communicating between people, seamless human-machine interactions, uh, treatments, novel treatments for psychiatric and neurologic disorders, and ultimately, if we really understand how the brain encodes information and processes it, I think it really gives us a better chance for um, creating better models for artificial intelligence. And since we're here talking about um, um, telecommunications, I also I think that in, if we're improving the way that information is relayed, and infor that I think that there's a real um, correlate relationship between how culture and technology evolve with um, the rate of information transfer. For instance, the age of reason and the, the scientific revolution and the age of enlightenment were really predicated by the printing press. That, you know, in, in the mid-16th century, when you, they suddenly created the printing press, suddenly information was disseminated at a much faster rate. So people started to think more and learn more from the, the discoveries that people were making. And that really kind of transited through the, uh, through the ensuing centuries that, you know, with with the evolution of you know, modern uh, countries and uh, infrastructure that supported postal systems, the telegraph, and the phone, that you see kind of a, a matching level of increase in technology. And I think that today with the internet, there's an explosion of information, and technology is moving at almost at a dizzying pace. And I think that hopefully in the future, as these techniques of you know, improved information transfer rates with the BCI technologies, that we'll see that even more dramatic uh, changes in technology. And so let me close with, just to give you a sense for how quickly technology moves, I want to tell you about Pong. And this is what they said in the 70s. This is from Time. Seven quarters later, they were having extended volleys, and the constant Pong was attracting the curiosity of others at the bar. Before closing, everybody in the bar played the game. The next day, people were lined up outside Andy Capps to, at, to te, at 10 a.m. to play Pong. Around 10 o'clock that night, the game suddenly died. The machine coin container was full. That's in the 70s. People were lining up to play Pong, thinking this is the most amazing thing. When you think about it, now 30 years later, these video games are commonplace. They don't even attract our attention. We certainly wouldn't line up outside of a bar to play a video game. But ne and I think that in 30 years, you know, it's been a dramatic change in, in what we're seeing in, in technology. And I think that, you know, kind of thinking about it now, we're essentially playing the equivalent of Pong right now with brain-computer interfaces. Any questions? Yeah, back there in the blue shirt. Yeah, you, uh, you know, this, you were reading a of information out of the motor cortex. You went to the sensory part, and have you looked for impulses there? And have you ever thought about, or have you ever tried putting some information back in and seeing if somebody's going to actually see or hear something? No, I haven't, but people are doing that. 
Um, certainly haptic feedback and uh, especially visual prosthetics if something is, has been a very active field that people are involved in ranging from uh, s stimulation anywhere along the visual access from your retina to your optic nerve to actually to your visual cortex and there are people out there actually who have impl experimentally implanted um, uh, brain you know, uh, electrode arrays implant, uh, placed over their occipital cortex that back part of the brain uh, to stimulate uh, vision people are completely blind um, and they're basically, they're able to see what we call phosphors, or kind of bright flashing lights with these stimulation, and are actually able to utilize this construct to maneuver around a room. So that, that's definitely happening. Yeah. Um, where are the cones, oh, yeah. where are the colors that the cones receive mixed? I'm thinking of impressionist paintings. I quite just... Well, as far as wh where, you, the colors that we see, where do they, uh, where are they processed? So just to repeat the question, uh, she, uh, uh, she's asking where are the, co the colors that we see mixed. And now you're starting to kind of go beyond some of my kind of you know, expertise, which is more um, uh, optics, optic physiology. But uh, uh, the, the information is initially processed in the eye, uh, where, where you have rods and cones, as you mentioned. Uh, a lot of that information goes to the back of the brain. And there's what are called ocular do dominance columns which first process um, po you know, points of light, and then uh, those points of light are further syn synthesized in other columns, which then are bars, and they're what are called ocular blobs, uh, which are in cortex, which have a, um, have a certain processing uh, for particular uh, colors. Now, uh, as far as how exactly that uh, processing has occurred, I'm not sure it's entirely clear at this juncture. Part of it's in the eye, but also part of that processing goes on in the brain. In the brain, that's right. Not so much in the nerve itself, no. Yeah. I thank you for your presentation. It's exciting work. Is, it, is any of this have any implications for the ability to download the contents of the human brain and we with a series of computer files? So is there anybody thinking about that or is any of this work trending in that direction? People have done certain th things like that in, uh, in mice, actually, where uh, in the hip, so one, of the, one part of our brain called the hippocampus is um, involved in uh, 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 memory pr predominantly, but in, in particular, spatial memory. So for instance, like if, if a mouse is navigating through a, a maze, they, they monitor its uh, firing rates and basically, there's very selective firing patterns for a given path that it takes. And you can actually take that information out and, and know kind of which direction the mouse has gone in. And you can actually replay. And when the mouse is sleeping, you can actually listen in again, and the mouse actually replays it backwards. So that's kind of indicative of, of learning that's going on while you sleep. So the question is, how, how long do these electrodes stay in? Now, for these patients, this is a clinical, this research is piggybacked on top of a clinical, uh, clinical therapy. So they stay in for one to two weeks. But the other, I think, kind of getting at your question is how long can they stay in? And that's a question which we're investigating right now in monkey models. Um, now, people have done research in the past in uh, uh, other types of animal models, and they've shown that th these... Uh, um, Electric constructs can stay in for over a year without a degradation in signal. So essentially, you're asking about bit rate, like how, how much information can you transfer? And that's and and ba the, essentially in the uh, brain computer interface and neuroprosthetics world, that's that's kind of the kind of benchmark of, of kind of the it's almost the intellectual arms race where we always want to push and f see how how much information we can get out, so that you, not only are you doing one dimension. One dimensional control is a certain bit rate. Two dimensional control, say x, y axis, is another kind of level of bit rate information transfer. Then you get to three dimensions and then multi dimensions. And right now, with electrocorticography, we're at two dimensions. Um, we're working towards two dimensions with a click so that you can select. In the single unit systems, they're at uh, four dimensions now, meaning you can move in three dimensional space and grab. And uh, I don't think we've d defined what the information limits are yet, but uh, we were continually able to uh, kind of, with uh, evolving computer speeds and signal analysis methods, moving up and up and up. So I don't think we've defined our limit yet. So the yeah, question but, is, uh, like, is, is there, are, have people gone beyond the fact that just action potential firing rate as far as information encoding? And certainly there's, um, 
numerous way that, w ways that the neuron um, encodes information, not just in its firing rate, but in terms of the connections that it makes, what type of uh, tr neurotransmitters it's releasing, what type of neurotransmitters it's receptive to, and how those other uh, neurotransmitter receptors uh, activate it or inhibit it. Uh, there's a lot of work going on in, th in that front. Um, uh, some are, and one of the one of the things that um, have it, people have really learned is that, for instance, the memory and the way that in our responsiveness is certainly uh, affected by kind of synap what we call synaptic plasticity, like how again how responsive it is and how uh, to certain transmitters. Do we know, for instance, like the kind of the C, G, A, and T of uh, how information is good? I'd say we're probably at maybe like you know, C, G, but I don't think we have all the letters yet. Um, we certainly know, for instance, that action potential firing rate, frequency, location, um, and how those frequency change all are responsible for encoding inf information. And we've been very successful at utilizing those letters to essentially um, provide types for, you know, certain cognitive intentions, ranging from motor function, you know, such as motor direction, as well as, um, for instance, we're starting to decode phonemes, basically components of words over speech cortex. We're able to get at that. So, but I don't think we have all the letters yet, but I think we're getting there. Right, do you foresee a time when the cell mentioned downloading it? You can actually upload thoughts when to the other person? Assuming that we have, again, I, I, don't think, I don't think it's impossible. I think that theoretic, theoretically, I think we're very much in the early stages right now. Right now we're decoding uh, primarily. I don't think we're at the level of encoding, although people with visual cortex and auditory stimulators are starting to do a little bit of that, but it's um, it's, the, it's the early stages of that. We are anonymous. We are legion. We do not forgive. We do not forget. Expect us.